Um, <laughs> uh, and this session is all about um, uh, PMD, I suppose, uh, producing and producing films and using the internet and social media to, to promote your film and build an audience for your film. And I'm delighted to welcome Ollie Harbottle from uh, Dogwoof, distributor here. Uh, ben Campus, whose company is called Film and Campaign, uh, who is a campaign organiser. Uh, um, Rebecca Day from the Scottish Documentary Institute, uh, who is an outreach producer, impact producer. These are all evolving titles, and that's something that we're going to discuss and, and get under the skin of. And uh, Nick Higgins, um, producer and director, also from Scottish Documentary Institute, who's going to chair the panel for us. So welcome. Please give everybody a round of applause. Thank you. Um, I should probably say I'm not actually from the Scottish Documentary Institute, but, but, we're, all, but, we're, but we're all really good pals, so it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> Yes, we're here today about uh, getting creative with distribution and um, the role of the producer of marketing and distribution first coined by John Rees when he wrote his book about, um, uh, what was it, making money outside the box office? Exactly. Think outside the Think box outside office. outside the box office. Yeah. And that was back in 2009. Um, and so uh, since that time, documentary in particular, but not just documentary, uh, have very much uh, looked towards self-distribution or innovative strategies of getting to the cinema, getting to the audience. And that landscape has significantly changed with social media, with video on demand. Um, and so this term that um, was, was always controversial from the start um, has continues to be something of a, of a question mark. And here in Scotland, we're actually, um, it's something we're pretty interested in. Creative Scotland have backed a new scheme called Make Your Market, which has been run by uh, the Scottish Documentary Institute, and we are tonic, and we have two trainee um, PMDs, producers of marketing distribution, in the audience here that are working with two documentary projects and um, two fiction projects. And I should declare I am one of the documentary projects, so I have a very live interest in this. Um, but before we unpack it further, I thought we'd just go quickly around the panel for something of a, of a sort of um, introduction and overview as to where they see distribution currently being at. And I thought I might start with you, Ollie, with a few interesting um, words downstairs. And if you could just say something about how Dogwoof sees this market and where it currently works in getting to an audience. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so Dogwoof is a distribution company which was set up in 2004. Um, when we started, we were releasing foreign language art house, independent films, uh, but we quickly realized that it was a very tough market. Um, there was kind of 20, 30 distribution companies all really fighting for about 5% of the market. What we also realized quite early on was that with the exception of kind of big name documentarians like Michael Moore, or Morgan Spurlock or Al Gore, no one was really putting documentaries in cinema. So we quite quickly on saw a gap in the market and that no one else was doing this. So we made the decision in 2007 with a film called Black Gold that we were going to start specializing in theatrical documentaries because rather than being one of 20 companies fighting for 5% of the market, why not be just one, the, the one and only distributor kind of fighting for the 1% of the market? Um, we saw a big success with Black Gold <coughs> and um, worked very closely with the producers who I guess were early examples of PMDs. They came with a lot of relationships, a lot of collateral which they brought to the table and helped make the, the release of the film very successful and we can talk about that a bit more. And then um, we, we saw a sudden flurry of kind of big campaigning documentaries. In 2009 we released a film called The Age of Stupid which was the first crowdfunded film. Um, and again, there was this, uh, a huge kind of release around the film, working very collaboratively with the filmmakers. Uh, we quickly followed that with a film called The End of the Line, um, which was about sustainable fishing. And suddenly there was a, this kind of real zeitgeist purple patch for kind of the ca campaigning activist documentaries. So in 2009, 2010, that's kind of where we positioned ourselves. Um, off the back of that, um, probably because of the success of these films, um, suddenly a lot of these films started to be made and we so start, started to see slight audience fatigue. It actually got slightly harder to put these films into cinemas. I think 
audiences got a little bit tired of going to the cinema, paying ten pounds to be told that the world's going to end or that something's really bad. Um, so we realised that we needed to diversify ourselves, and just we we now do the whole broad spectrum of, of documentaries, from art documentaries, music documentaries, etc. But that's not to say that these other documentaries have don't still exist, um, and it, especially in the documentary market, there's been a real shift towards finding other ways to get audiences to see to see these films um, and a, a big reason for that is that television is no longer kind of the safety net for documentaries um, sadly channel 4 basically stopped doing them bbc storyville is really the last existing strand for for feature length documentaries and most tv now relies on <coughs> factual entertainment as a, as a kind of cheaper more uh, populist alternative so these films are still being made, but they're, getting, they're not getting the, the usual exhibition that they used to rely on, as in TV. So a lot of these filmmakers are now looking at theatrical distribution. Um, in 2001, there were four documentaries released in cinemas. Last year, it was over 100. Um, and obviously, Dogwoof and there's a couple of other distributors who will release documentaries, but we can't, uh, we can't accommodate all those films. So you're seeing a lot of now PMDs, self-releases, um, and that's kind of where the market's at. Uh, from a documentary point of view. Thank you, Ollie. Ben, I wonder if you could say a wee bit about <coughs> how you came to find yourself working in this very particular niche. Well, I don't have a particular background in you know, either distribution or marketing. I come from a sort of filmmaking background myself. But uh, a couple of years ago, kind of really saw so many new opportunities that could be explored in terms of new tools and strategies available. Um, and became the, one of the first ever producers of marketing uh, and distribution, uh, certainly the, the first in Scotland, in 2011 with the Scottish Documentary Institute and worked there then for, for over three years on various films, including I Am Breathing, which you may have heard of, or Future My Love. And um, we were always kind of trying to sort of push the boundaries with I Am Breathing. We did this big global screening day. Together with Rebecca, we organized uh, some 300 screenings in 60 countries, most of them on a single day. Um, and, and, you know, these kind of things. Um, but I always thought that the expectations to the role of the producer in marketing and distribution were a bit too complex. Um, in that, you know, for some people, I had to look over every little bit of a licensing agreement and, you know, see if these windows are right. And I was like, oh, I'm not a lawyer. You know? um, for other people, I had to know about every latest tech tool coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, for other people, I had to be the social media guy 24-7 across 10 different accounts. So I, it was like sort of, I felt I could never quite do everybody justice. So when I started my own company a bit over a year ago, um, I focused on sort of getting people organized. I'm a believer that we all should sort of take ownership of our audience and, you know, try and take them with us from project to project. And, uh, you know, there's, there's not just kind of talk to our sort of film industry mates about our films, but kind of start at, you know, whoever could be most interested, uh, who could be the super core audience, as some people call it, uh, for the subject matter of a film. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of organizing campaigns, helping get people get organized. I specialize in campaigning software and adapting that for, for filmmaking use. Um, do this mostly for clients across Europe at the moment and a few in North America as well. Thank you, Ben. Rebecca, um, you worked with Ben, but if Ben was the organizer, which part did you have in all those productions? So I'm a, a new, new producer, I'm producing my first two features at the moment and during all my training to be a producer I ended up working on a lot on the distribution of films, that seemed to be where it always fell in the companies that I was working with and, and when I came back to SDI in 2012 um, we were just about to release I Am Breathing and I ended up doing all the I say audience engagement, but it was more the niche, or it's the niche audience, so it's a, it's a film about motor neuron disease, and I was the person who was dealing directly with that audience. So the people connected to the issue rather than the film community, as it were, and I think that connection is very different to the way that you would go and distribute a film in the traditional sense in terms of, you know, working with a sales agent, finding out your distributor in your own territory, putting it into cinemas. It's, it's, it's a different draw, it's a different reason to bring an audience to a film. So we organized a lot of community screenings. We're still d taking this model with all of our films now, is you do, you do your theatrical release, and alongside that you do your community, re your community release. So 
we ask people within the community that you've identified to host their own screenings of the film and that interaction with the audience is amazing because they come to it and they're just already connected to the issue and they, they, the screenings are full. It's very different to a cinema audience where you just it's hit and miss, you don't know how many people are going to turn up. But with the community screenings, you can have 100 people in a room and they're all really interested in the topic and it's really engaging. Okay, I, th I thought we'd take an opportunity to talk a little bit about specific projects and dig in a wee bit deeper. And on that note, I might start with you, Rebecca. Maybe we could talk about Seven Songs and you could say a little bit about that and your current strategy and how, how you're delivering that. Yeah, so we just finished um, a film called Seven Songs for a Long Life and it was filmed in a hospice in Scotland over three years. And we released it, we did a very small concentrated release in October. Um, we paired up with Hospice UK and they have an awareness week in October every year. So we launched our theatrical screening as well as our community screenings across the whole of the UK during that week. So Hospice UK worked with us to get all the hospices involved. So they were screening within their own hospices. We were asking film clubs and communities to, to do their own screenings in village halls, in churches. Um, we had funeral directors putting screenings on. You know, it was really varied who came on board. And we also had about 25 cinema screenings across the country, which was small, but it's, you know, for a self-distribution, that was, we were happy with that. Um, and then immediately after that, about a week after Hospice UK Week, it went out on BBC Scotland. And since then, we've continued to have community screenings. So that was our you know, theatrical release and broadcast. And then now we're, we're coming around to another Awareness Week, Dying Matters Week. So we'll do the whole thing again. We'll start pushing for these community screenings. And then we release our educational package. And that's where we start working with practitioner, medical practitioners. And you know, so it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> so it's like all the different elements. But now, in terms of um, supporting that with funding and finance and, um, and having partners, as you sort of mentioned, how does that work? Well, Hospice UK didn't give us any money because charities don't, NGOs don't really have money, but they did give us a huge amount of promotional support. So without them, we obviously wouldn't have been able to find our screening partners. We went to BritDoc. They have, um, they have a fund, the Connect Fund for distribution for documentaries, and it's fantastic. Um, they're just, they're very free, you know, they're very sort of cooperative with the money that they give you and just help you design your campaign, really. So that allowed us to provide the film for free to hospices, which was really important, because I think they don't have the funding to be able to put these screenings on. It made it much easier for them. Creative Scotland were extremely supportive with their distribution fund as well, and obviously with the production of the film. And now, for the next part of the campaign, to help us with the educational side of things, we'll go to Awards for All in Scotland. Haven't got that fund yet, but um, we're hoping we've, we've had initial good conversations with them. So, and then we have the revenue from the cinema, from the theatrical release as well. I mean, without going to <coughs> exact detail, if you don't like to, the, the the distribution and impact stage of the film, in terms of the funds required to deliver that, is that as much as the production, or what percentage might that be of a production budget? It's a totally separate budget. So we raise. <coughs> You know, everything, all the materials that we've pulled together for the outreach has, most of it's gone through the outreach budget rather than the production budget because um, we had to create a lot more DCPs and all your deliverables just to get them out during that concentrated week. Um, and then all the posters and everything as well. But it's, it was about 70,000. So that doesn't really make you much profit, but it covers your costs and yeah. So that's assuming that you get the revenue that you're hoping for in that time. Okay, and I, I think it's probably worth saying, and this is a good moment to come to you, Ben. I mean, this is perhaps mm -hmm. an area where documentary is different from a lot of fiction feature films, <coughs> that there is sometimes this notion of what they call the virtuous circle, which is that you're giving back to the people that contributed in some ways to the film. And so, I mean, I know it's not profit isn't the end point for, for everyone, but it certainly isn't um, for, for some of these projects. Maybe you could say a wee bit about giving back to those audiences and how you first build those audiences? Yeah, I mean, one of the arguments you always hear when, kind of, when, when you talk to producers about the need for outrage campaigns is sort of something like, oh, but it's not going to make us any money, is it? You know? And I think that's one of the kind of biggest misunderstandings because, um, well, first of all, you know, it will make you some money because more people will be aware of your film and, and buy your film. 
Um, but also, you know, I guess we're all doing what we're doing, um, you know, not to become rich, but be because we believe in film, we believe in documentary and, and the, the storytelling through it that we find so powerful. You know, so if we can reach more people with that and move them and, you know, have some sort of effect on them, call it impact or not, you know, um, I mean, that's, that should just be an integral part of the package, you know, there should be no question about it. Because um, otherwise, why, why are we doing what we're doing, you know? Um, the, this whole impact thing, by the way, I mean, that's, that's an interesting one I always find. Um, you, you've probably heard about impact producers, which are rather fashionable. Do you call yourself an impact producer? I'm starting to. Yeah? Yeah. Because it, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, well, I always said kind of impact is the result of successful outreach, kind of. You know, it, impact producing as such is a bit tricky. It's like sort of, you know, calling yourself an award-winning filmmaker before you've finished the film because you're kind of anticipating a good result sort of thing, you know. Um, so to me, it's still kind of outreach work in the, in the widest sense. But, you know, all this thinking about sort of, you know, what is impact on what kind of levels can it happen? You know, it starts with raising awareness about something, then, you know, changing people's minds, then changing people's behaviors, you know, maybe they don't buy this or that anymore, or, you know, s changing the structures that surround us in terms of, you know, politics, corporations, whatever, you know, there's so many kind of levels to this, and, and you can sort of, sort of place yourself on that, that ladder, how, ladder, how far you want to go with, with your project. Um, a really good resource in that respect is the, the Impact Field Guide that was published by Brit Talk. Um, if you just Google that, you'll, you'll find it, um, with kind of lots of case studies. Um, you should never try and copy another campaign, that's another rule, I, I guess, but, uh, you know, at least there's a good bit of inspiration and sample budgets and, and these kind of things there. Um, generally speaking about budget for this, because you mentioned that, I mean, John Rees uh, has always been promoting the 50-50 rule, you know, which says, you know, 50% of your, your, your money um, should go into the sort of marketing and distribution side of things. 50% um, should of your time should go into it, you know, and 50% and of your, uh, whatever else do you need? Idealism, you know, enthusiasm, whatever, you know. So um, it should just be as important uh, as the, the production side of things. And I guess, you know, if you look at whatever big studios in Hollywood, you'll always see that the marketing budget is, you know, in the region of the, the production budget or even higher. So, you know, why are we not moving in the same direction? Or maybe we are moving now slowly in that direction. Before I hand over to Ollie, perhaps you could say something about <coughs> the other end, as it were. So not the impact, but the generating of the audience, perhaps even before the production, because a project you're working on at the moment isn't, hasn't yet been released. How does that operate? Ben, Bugs. Oh, OK. I thought you said Ollie. No, I said before I hand over to Ollie. OK, sorry, yes. Yeah. Um, Bugs uh, is an interesting case. Bugs is a documentary about edible insects um, uh, done by Danish documentary. Um, and, you know, people always say you're, as, as part of your communications around a film, you're supposed to talk about your film only actually 10 or 20 percent of the time. And the rest should be a wider kind of dialogue about the subject matter that, you know, your film is a good vehicle for. Um, so the big question is always sort of how do you kind of produce all that additional content? And in this case, we kind of went out and looked at sort of anything that was available on the, on the web in terms of, you know, information, if I was ever interested in, you know, the concept of eating insects, um, what would I find? And we th thought, okay, this is, there's sort of, you know, some very academic stuff, the, you know, all the research. Then there's um, the foodies that are all excited about it, you know, kind of, oh, I cooked something with ants or whatever. And then you have the, um, the ones that are kind of driven by some sort of corporate interests behind them. So there wasn't really any sort of neutral, independent side to look at that. So we thought, you know, a long time before we, we, we released the film, we're going to start working on the site, and the site then went live uh, uh, end of December, so roughly four or five uh, months before the film will premiere. And um, the idea is to kind of build up an audience so by the time the film gets released, you know, there's, there are already people anticipating the film. And you don't start from scratch and say, you know, oh, I just finished this and, you know, um, come and like me and support me and whatever, you know. And the other thing there is, if you, if you look at the website, which is bugsfeed.com, 
um, you'll see that you know it's not a film website that has then some sort of content latched onto it. It's the complete opposite. You know, it's just a website about sort of getting a taste of edible insects, and then hopefully you'll on that s website discover that oh, in the sidebar there's a little thing about the film that's coming up, or you know, if you watch one of our videos, you suddenly oh, this is from footage for this film. What is this film kind of? So the idea is that you know the the users of the site discover the film as you know rather than something being in their face and through that are more likely to kind of take ownership of that as they are discovery. Oh, what is that? You know, can I need to have a look? And oh yeah, that looks interesting. So that's the approach we're, we're following there at the moment. Ollie, so if you have producers, producers of marketing distribution, producers of impact that come to you and if they do still come to you with projects, can you work with them? Can you get involved in that sort of way in very bespoke campaigns like this? Or how do you look upon this phenomena now? Um, uh, in short, absolutely, yes. I think it's really a, a case of a producer coming to us and handing over the baton for us to do our job. I think what we do as a distribution company is, is specialist knowledge about getting films to maximum audiences. And we don't pretend to have some of the skills that PMDs do, and vice versa. I don't think PMDs necessarily can always get the biggest audience. So. It's always a, been a collaboration. Um, I mean, the most recent example of a film that really did make impact, and I would actually say <coughs> it's arguable how many films do make impact, as in visible impact, but we released in 2013 the film Blackfish, um, which has, has become, uh, become a kind of global phenomenon. Um, it's about uh, keeping orcas in captivity in SeaWorld. Um, in the two years since the release of the film, kind of SeaWorld shares have fallen 83%, I think they've kind of changed their whole policy, and, and it's actually a, a film where you've seen visible impact. Now with that, we weren't involved in the production. We saw the film at Sundance Film Festival in 2013, and we picked up the film, interestingly, not just for the UK, but we actually picked up the, the global rights for that, minus America. Um, and then we basically took over the campaign from there. So we built the entire online profile, we built the, the website for the film, we created the social media channels, and then we were given the relationships that the producers had formed with um, organizations such as Born Free, which was a big supporter, um, PETA, the, um, the animal activist com uh, organization. And then our job was to get this film into as many cinemas um, on as many TV channels around the world as possible. So it was very much a collaboration. So we did a very big cinema release. Um, it played in 200, or 200 plus cinemas across the country. Um, we sold it to the BBC. It's been seen by five million people in the UK. We then sold it to Netflix, um, which is always kind of the elephant in the room in documentaries, but is actually a very good force for good, I think. Um, and just in terms of eyeballs, um, that was the impact we were bringing, just getting the film out as much as possible. It was, it's the number one performing documentary on iTunes of all time. Um, and we were kind of in charge of synchronizing releases. So. We worked very closely with a US distributor to make sure that we released the film at the same time. Um, you often only get one hit at publicity, so by working together, we managed to make kind of maximum noise, maximum awareness at the same time, and then kind of coordinating all the other territories, all the other countries' releases. Um, and that's what we do, so that's our job. Um, and so that was very much a collaboration, and, and thankfully an example where impact has happened. Yeah, that's a fantastic example. I wonder if you could say something about your own pop-up cinema scheme that you have as well. Yeah. Um, so we have a thing called Pop-Up Cinema, which is at popupcinema.net. And basically, it's an automated booking service where anyone, anyone in this room, an individual, a charity, a business, a, a government office, can book any of our films um, at the same time as the film is in cinemas. Um, going back to what I said earlier, when we... Um, we started to see audience fatigue in terms of traditional cinema exhibition. This was really a direct response to that because we knew that there were still people out there uh, who wanted to see these films, but maybe they didn't want to go to the cinema and also maybe cinemas didn't want to keep putting on these kind of documentaries. So it was a direct response to that and with support from the British Film Institute, we kind of created this software and built this website. Um, and we now have repeat um, customers who, who have booked our films continually every time there's a new release. Um, they book a film. How it works is there's a tiered license fee 
kind of mechanism. So if you're an individual, you pay the kind of least money. If you're a big corporate, then you pay the most money. Um, if you book it on release, as in the same time as it's in cinemas, there's a premium to pay if you're happy to wait a few weeks. I think it's eight weeks and it's cheaper. Um, and this allows anyone in the country to, to put on a screening. Um, and we also encourage them to be entrepreneurs. We want them to kind of, we want it to be an alternative exhibition circuit. So we charge a one-off license fee and then whoever books the film can then charge tickets as they want and they can make a little business for themselves. So it's really kind of supporting alternative exhibition. Okay, great, thanks.